If you ever hope to grow your business beyond a certain level, you'll likely be faced with the reality that at some point you're going to have to hire someone to help you out. You're going to need to learn the art of delegation. And today I want to share with you the story of my first hire as someone who is super stubborn and afraid to trust people that it might encourage you and how you can make your first hire in order to scale your business. Welcome to episode 71 of The Graham Cocker Show, where I'm here to help you build your online business, work less, and live and give more. I'm your host, Graham Cochran. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Got a good question from one of my students recently saying, Graham, in your experience, when did you start to let other people in? How did you do it? Which parts of the business did you delegate and which did you keep doing yourself? Love this question. I've been getting a lot of questions about this having a team, whether it's part-time, what does it look like to hire? So many of us are one-man, one-woman shows, solopreneurs, and you can do a lot by yourself, man, thanks to the internet and automation. This is a machine that you can build and run by yourself, but you might find that you're getting to a point where you're hitting a ceiling and it is hard to grow, or you are just physically running out of time, and so the thought might have crossed your mind, should I hire somebody? Who would I hire? What do I hire them to do? How much do I pay them? How do I manage it? Will it just create more work for myself? I don't know anybody that I trust. Is this really good use of the money? I have so many questions, right? And so I can't answer all of them today, but what I thought I would do is answer this question and share the story of my first hire because I think it's a great model for you and your first hire and unpack just the simple two-step process of delegating and hiring somebody. It's easier now than ever before. I'll give you a couple of resources as well at the end of this episode. Um, So hopefully that'll help you out. And when we talk about delegation, you got to understand I'm a guy that never wanted to hire anybody. I never have wanted a team. I'm not interested in building a big team. Uh, I'm interested in just growing the business. And I've always felt like I can and should be able to do it all myself. I kind of pride myself in doing a lot of it myself. Um, I don't know if that's just because I'm stubborn or prideful. I don't know if it's because, you know, it's wise to know how to do everything in your business, at least know how, even if you hire someone else to do it down the road, you can make an argument for that. But I know at some point I hit a wall and I needed to make a hire. And it was a beginning of a beautiful journey for me. I still don't have a very big team, um, but it was a very, very helpful process for me. Uh, Before I share the story, though, you got to understand there are two important truths when it comes to scaling your business. Because the only reason why we'd wanna talk about hiring, I think, is because you wanna scale. You want to grow your business bigger than it currently is, or you want to work less in your business and keep your revenue the same. To me, that's still scale, it's just two ways of looking at it. The business grows, or your hourly rate grows because you're making the same amount but working less. And those are two beautiful things. I like both. (laughs) I've been on a journey to grow my business revenue, while working less in the business. And that's what I teach you here on this channel every single week is to, to do both. Grow your online business, work less, right? They're, they're not mutually exclusive. So there's two important truths you gotta understand about doing that, scaling your business. Number one is, and even if you do it all yourself, you can't and shouldn't do it all yourself. 100% believe that. You can start that way, but at some point, there's going to be things that you can't do on your own. And even if you could, I don't think you should. But that doesn't mean you need a team. It doesn't even mean you need a full-time employee. I don't have any full-time employees, okay? But it does mean that you should bring somebody else on. We'll talk about what that looks like in a minute. And the second truth that's related is that not every task that your business requires requires you. Not every task that your business requires requires you to do it. So to run your business, there are certain tasks that are necessary, that are required. Some only you can do, but there are some that somebody else could do just as well as you, if not better than you, but even just as well as you. 
somebody else could do it. And it's important to make that distinction. If you don't believe that, you're just like me years ago, you're kind of stubborn, kind of prideful. But at some point, you should be able to recognize that there are some tasks that look, just about anybody with a brain could do this. Why am I still doing it? We'll unpack that in a minute. So let me just share the story of my first hire. You gotta understand, my business, The Recording Revolution, was so much of YouTube and my blog and creating content and connecting with amazing people like you. And it was exciting and it was growing. And I worked full time at it. I was really fortunate, AKA I had lost a job, but I had nothing else to do. So I, I worked on it. I also had no income. So you can, some people say, well, you got to work full time in your business. I'm like, yeah, but I didn't get to get paid for two years. So I don't know which I would have chosen. I probably would have chosen start part time while I had a job and pivot, but that wasn't the option God gave me. So I had full time to work on it. Um, I actually only worked four days a week. I've never worked more than four days a week on my business. So 32 hours a week was the most I would give it. And I was just making videos. I was writing articles, sending out emails, creating courses and trying everything I could. And it was fun and exciting. But you gotta understand when you start a business like this, a content business, and you start to build your audience, what happens? Your audience grows. When your audience grows and you serve them well, what happens? They wanna connect with you. And so they would email me. My fans and my students would email me all the time. And that number, you know, it started with just my mom and my brother watching my videos and reading my articles, even though they know nothing about music or care, but they would support me and it would grow, right? So now it's not just my friends or my parents or my family. It's now strangers that I don't know who are watching and ingesting my stuff, reaching out. And I loved all the emails. I still do, but I loved getting them and I loved responding to them. And I would respond to every single email that came in. I prided myself on being accessible and available. And that was a great thing to do in the beginning. You know, I've heard it said, when your business is small, when you're starting out, do things that don't scale. What does that mean? That means do the things that you wish you could do for everybody all the time, because you know what? You can when it's small. My wife, Shay, she's a multi-six-figure business owner. When she started her first business, every time a customer made a purchase in her shop, she would write a handwritten thank you card and mail it to them. That's something that you can't scale, but she did it in the early years. So it's fun to do that stuff in the beginning, but when it needs to scale, AKA the numbers grow, you come into a problem. So I found myself spending three plus hours a day just clearing through my fan and student email. Questions about which microphone sounds best for white rap vocals, which doesn't even make any sense. Like to how do I use this piece of software to uh, just thank you so much for that video to could you make a video on this or I'm confused about this topic. Just all kinds of emails, right? Hate mail, plenty of that. I got that in year one and, and has never stopped. But three plus hours a day in email, that's insane. That's three plus hours where you're not being productive on your business, you're just answering email. So for these first four years, like I said, I've been priding myself in personally responding to every single email. Now imagine me when there's three hours a day of email and I just, I can't keep up. I remember going to the beach with my wife and my, you know, my oldest daughter, was the only one born at the time. Maybe Vera was born, she might've been a baby, but we got away for three or four nights, the Florida Panhandle, just rented a condo, just got away. And I remember I brought my laptop and I remember opening my laptop one morning before we got out to the beach and Shay, my wife's like, babe, what are you doing? We're on vacation. I was like, yeah, but babe, I, I got three hours of email a, a, every day to deal with. And at the very least, I got to take care of the customer email because if someone didn't get their download or their login or the product or they want to refund, like I, I can't just walk away for three days and not respond to email. And I remember like the look on her face. It was like that look of like, oh crap, we can't even take a three day vacation without you having to bring your laptop. And that's when I realized so I just created a monster. I thought this was cool, but actually it's worse than when I had a day job and I worked for someone else and I took vacation. I didn't have to bring a laptop. I was off. They didn't need me. They had other people. They had other people. So I was trapped and I believed two lies. One was that no one could do email for me. 
as much as I knew I needed to help and I couldn't be in the email every day, I was like, but nobody can respond to my emails for me. That just doesn't make sense. What would they do? Like, how would they answer all the questions that I get? Like, they can't, they don't know me. They aren't me. People are asking for my opinion. How could that possibly work? So I believe that lie. It turns out that was a lie. I also believe the lie that my people will be so upset. Oh my gosh, when they email in and they get a response from someone else, they're gonna be so pissed. Two lies, which just shows how narcissistic and bent inward I'd become as if I was some big deal that only I can do this and that my people will be livid if there's someone else, as if I owed them my presence in their inbox. It's interesting how we have these mental scripts of these, these limiting beliefs that really define what we do and don't do. And I believe those two lies. Well, it turns out I was completely wrong. And I came to a breaking point after that vacation and I decided to just try this whole hiring thing. And I was too scared to, to do it the traditional way. So what did I do? I hired a friend. I had a buddy of mine who had a, a full-time job, but he was looking to make a little bit of extra money. And I said, hey, dude, could I hire you for 10 hours a week to get in my inbox and take care of most of the emails that I really probably don't need to take care of? Customer emails, hate mail, common questions I get from fans, and I'll pay you. I'll pay you. And I think I paid him $15 an hour for 10 hours a week. Okay, 150 bucks a week, 600 bucks a month. I brought him over to my home office because he lived in town. For a couple of days, he came in person just for a few hours for me to train him. Like I had to explain like what I do for a living. Nobody knew, a lot of people still don't know what I do for a living. Like my family members are still confused sometimes. I had to explain, here's what I do. Here's how the business model works. And I'm explaining like content marketing and email lists and lead magnets and email funnels and online courses and sales pages and the back end of stuff. Like then we, I hadn't started with Kajabi yet. This was 2013. I was about to jump on Kajabi, but I still was selling courses through eJunkie. They would get like a digital download, right? And so I had to explain how this all worked and trained him on the business model, the products I had, so he was like well-versed in the products. But then also, here are the types of emails I get. We would go through my inbox and you could kind of categorize. It was almost educating me as I went through the email. I used to view every email as independent and unique like a special snowflake email. But as I was explaining to him, I almost realized, oh my gosh, you could lump all the emails that come into my inbox under certain common buckets. There's the hate mail, there's the fan mail, there's the product questions about my courses, there's the technical questions about the craft that I teach, music recording. There's customer issues, like didn't get my download or I want a refund. And then there's like business inquiries or brands that want to collaborate. I mean, there's a basically six or seven common buckets. And I was like, dude, they, every email pretty much falls under these categories. So I trained him. I had him create a Google Doc of like the different categories of emails. And I had him, we use Gmail or G Suite for email, and I had him create some canned responses, which are really easy. So like always have the same response pre-written that if it's like a customer refund request, you can pre-populate an email that says, oh, absolutely, I just took care of your refund. You should see the funds in your account in the next five to seven business days, blah, 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 blah. And then he could just tweak the name and tweak it and he could save time by not having to rewrite the same email. So we created some of those. I didn't know about any of this stuff. I didn't have a grand plan, but I, as I was trying to train him, I was like, well, what would be easiest for him? And he was like, what would be easiest for us? And we figured it out together as a friend, trained him for a couple of days and then kind of let him go, okay? And the crazy thing is was, you know, it was a little rough first week or two. He had a lot of questions. He had to call me a lot and ask me how he, I would handle a certain email. But after two weeks of a sort of training period of him like checking in with me a lot, he, he began to understand how to respond to every email. 90 to 95% of the emails he could handle without bugging me. And all of a sudden, I could start my day without opening up my inbox. I was getting back a solid two hours a day of email. I still had about an hour a day to like respond to the ones that I needed to respond to, which was part of what I had him do and still to this day have my assistant do is take care of 80, 90% of the email and then delete the rest of them, curate my inbox, label the remaining emails that I must respond to, um, but they're labeled and there's fewer in there. So when I jump in, it's clean, it's minimized, it's it's organized and I can just get in and get out. I freed up these 10 hours of physical work 
that I could then use to film a new online course or survey my audience or shoot extra videos for YouTube, crazy stuff that would actually grow my business or write some new sales copy. I had 10 physical new hours a week, but not only that, I had mental space mental space. This is something that has taken me forever to learn and relearn is that physical time, having physical time to do something is one thing, but saying, look, I've got time on my calendar to do X, Y, and Z. Why do I feel exhausted even though I have enough time to do it? It's because some things have mental weight attached to them that's like phantom hours. It's a phantom burden that you can't see. So even freeing up just 10 hours a week of inbox, it's not just 10 hours back of my life. It's a, probably an equivalent of 20 hours of mental clarity and space. You feel fresher, you feel sharper in those 10 hours than you would have. So it's almost like having 20 good hours back. And so what would happen, and I remember this, this was 2013, this was like the summer of 2013. Right after I hired my buddy, Cameron, to do my email for me for 10 hours a week remotely, uh, I had so much clarity to launch, to map out and launch a brand new high-priced course that was like mm, five to 10 times the cost of my most popular courses at the time. It was super niche for my audience, but it was a massive hit. And I remember it launched and I made about $45,000 when it launched that fall. And I'd, I'd never done a launch that big at that time. It was so exciting. Uh, and so I remember making that money when my wife and I, we flew to Vegas. We got one of those like, you know, where they offer you a free stay in Vegas. Uh, and it's like, the only catch is you have to go listen to some timeshare pitch. And I was like, oh, sure, I'll go to a meeting and and listen to a pitch. Uh, and so we got three nights free on the strip uh, in Las Vegas. And we had this amazing trip. And we just spent too much on food. And I went to see Chris Angel uh, perform magic, which was way overpriced for him to do like five or six tricks. And then just talk about how big his YouTube channel was. And I was like, dude, why am I listening to you talk about YouTube? I'm here right now. Just do, do magic, bro. Make her disappear. Come on, do something cool. And so we just had a lot of fun. And I remember being on that trip and the sales were trickling in from this course. And I never thought of the course before. I never even would have thought of it had I not had the mental space and time from not being in my inbox. I got super creative the moment that happened. And that was the beginning of a huge growth phase for my business coming out of 2013 because I had time and mental space just by hiring one guy 10 hours a week, a buddy of mine who just wanted to make some extra money for him. He could do a couple hours in the evening while they watch Netflix or if he had a lunch break or whatever. He'd just do a little more hour in the morning, hour in the evening. I didn't care. As long as he was in it Monday through Friday, nothing on the weekends. He was bringing in an extra 600 bucks a month that he was using to pay off some debt or save or whatever he was doing. It was a win-win, and it allowed me to go make lots more money, way more money than I was paying him. This was my first hire. That role has been indispensable. Now, Cameron no longer does it. He moves on to start some of his own cool stuff. I've since had two other assistants in that role. And then that role, my current assistant in that role, it's beyond just email, right? I've expanded that, that virtual assistant because he's remote uh, to do creating Instagram content for me, to uh, creating you know YouTube thumbnails, to uploading my videos, to posting them on Facebook, to sending out the email to my list with what I want them to send out, to tagging my videos in YouTube, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, the stuff that I don't need to be doing, right? So right now I have a position and it's 20 hours a week of work. Uh, and it's been a really great fit because I've seen since 2013 how important that role was to my sanity. And you know what? To serving my people better. Now they get a response every day where some days I would be backlog on email and I wouldn't be in my inbox at all. And so then people would be waiting on me to get them a refund or they would feel like no one was responding. Now I have someone in there taking care of my people so that I can create content for my people. It's a team effort. And then when I get in the inbox, I can respond to the emails that I need to respond to. Make sense? So what I want to do really briefly is make the case for you that you should hire a VA, a virtual assistant. You don't need a huge team. Maybe you will have one eventually. You don't need full-time employees, although maybe you will eventually. But if you've never hired anybody, you need to just make that first part-time remote role hire just to get practice hiring, just to expand 
your concept of what your business can be when you don't have to do everything. There is something that feels like a luxury to have someone else working for you and working with you. So you're not even alone in the business. Some of, so much of this, depending on your personality, is psychological. I am an introvert. I work great by myself. I joke on, on this podcast, I, I'm sitting here all by myself, here in my office, all by myself, and I'm happy with it. I kind of like it. I got a nice view, downtown Tampa, Hillsboro River. It's comfortable. It's quiet. I can do my thing. But the sad truth is, is that I'm kind of lonely sometimes. And when you build everything by yourself and you launch everything by yourself, other than your spouse or your, your girlfriend or boyfriend or your family members or your roommates, that there's no one really to celebrate with or vent to or share or shoulder the burden of the ups and downs of your business. And so it can get pretty darn lonely. Having one person, even a remote VA that's five, 10 hours a week, makes you feel like it's not just you in the fight. You've got help. You've got someone who has uh, a dog in the fight, as it were. Like They have skin in the game. They care. They want the business to keep doing well so you can keep them employed. It's a pretty cool feeling. So there's just two steps. I want to share with you the two steps to your first hire, okay? They're super simple, but really, really important. Step number one, all right? Eliminate before you delegate. Okay, so before you actually delegate something, before you actually go hire somebody to do something, like maybe you're like, oh, this is awesome, Graham, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna hire somebody to do my email or you have uh, do my content uploads or do my tagging or whatever it is, right? Before you just go out and try to hire somebody, you gotta eliminate stuff. Never do something. Or worse, pay someone to do something that can just as easily be eliminated altogether. Like, there's no point in hiring someone to do something you don't want to do if you could eliminate that task entirely and it not really affect your business growth anyway. Because now you're paying someone to do something pointless that you shouldn't have even been doing yourself. You shouldn't do it. They shouldn't do it. Nobody should do it because it does not affect your business. So much of our businesses are filled with busy work. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about workaholism. That's the new status symbol. And I talked about three reasons why people overwork because we all work way too much. Some people work because they have to all the time. Some people work all the time because they want to. They have ego. They have guilt issues with their wealth, all kinds of stuff we unpack. And then some people work all the time because they think they have to. And that's a lot of business owners when a lot of what makes them think they have to work all the time is busy work, activities that they could just eliminate entirely and their business would hum along just about the same. Like one of those, for example, for a lot of people is social media. Like you could literally cut social media out and your business would probably be the same if you've built your business correctly, right? Social media is a great tool. There's nothing wrong with it. And if, if you can handle it in your business rhythm, great. But I hear from so many of you that social media is an unending, exhausting endeavor and you never feel like you're posting enough or the right things. And no one stops to ask, why am I doing this? that do it because everyone says I need to, because I feel like I need to, because it's not what you do. But like, you never ask like, how does this post put money in my pocket? Like, where's the actual connection? It's very hard to find one. Now, there is a role that social media can play, but can you find the direct link between all the activity you're doing around social media and money in your bank account? Many of you cannot. So why are you spending all the time doing it? It's interesting. Okay, so... You need to eliminate before you delegate. If you've never done that, just do an go go watch my video on the 80-20 rule. And then go watch my video on Parkinson's law. You can go watch those on my YouTube channel. Just search 80-20 or search Parkinson's law. Those will break down tactical methods you can follow to eliminate things entirely. Uh, things that I've eliminated or automated because some things that actually you can't eliminate, you could actually automate and have a, a piece of software do it for you. So you still don't need to hire somebody to do this. I have eliminated responding to YouTube comments on the Recording Revolution. I don't respond to YouTube comments. I haven't been doing that for almost 10 years. Um, responding to all social media comments. I haven't been doing that for many, many years. Um, I added an email autoresponder. That's an FAQ. So when you email the Recording Revolution, uh, you get an immediate email back from a robot that I wrote the email saying, hey, thanks so much for the message. I'm busy out there creating a ton of free content for you, so I can't be in my inbox all the time. 
Um, but maybe this FAQ will help you out. And it lists everything you can imagine. Like if you're a customer, you have an issue, my assistant will, will be with you within 24 hours, unless it's on the weekend. We don't work on the weekends. Um, if you have a question about which microphone to buy, check out this whole free guide on gear. If you have a question about my best mixing tips, check out this free guide. If you, It just gives you an FAQ. So that autom- autoresponder FAQ has eliminated a ton of email through automation. Uh, and then like for this brand, I stopped adding background music to my videos. I stopped adding B-roll and, and memes and overlays and all kinds of stuff that was slowing down the video editing process. And then at one point I was outsourcing someone else and hiring someone else to edit it. And then I realized when I just do a video without any music, without any B-roll, without any memes, it does just as well, if not better than when I spent the time or hired someone else to spend the time to do that. So why am I doing that? So I eliminated all of that. So eliminate or automate always before you delegate, right? This is something that I learned from Tim Ferriss in the four hour work week years ago. He has an amazing section and a chapter on elimination, but it's really, it's three step, eliminate, automate, then you delegate things. You have three things, that three tools you can use to remove you from having to do everything in your business. You can eliminate stuff, automate it, or delegate, which is what we're talking about today. And let's just kind of finish there. The hire I want you to make, if you haven't already, is a VA, a virtual assistant, because it's low risk, low cost, easy, to dipping your toes in the water of delegation and hiring. And it might be all you need also. For many of you, this might be all you ever need. But for some of you, it might be the gateway drug in a good way for like, ah, this is the power of delegating. It can work. There are other people that are smarter than me that are, that are capable or competent that can do a lot of these things for me. And then I can sort of free myself up so I can scale my business and be all in on the things that only I can be all in on. So I think VAs are a great first hire. Um, specifically, look to pay someone between seven and $20 an hour for five to 10 hours a week of work. That's a big range, right? It's a big range um, because it depends on if they're international, like out of the US or if they're in the US or Canada, you'll pay more for those. Uh, but there are a bunch of resources, we'll get to those in a minute, that you can use to hire people. But a $7 an hour to $20 an hour range is not unrealistic. Um, you can certainly pay more for a really good VA who can do a lot of high-level stuff. And you can pay less, but generally that's a range where most VAs are going to live. What are some things that a VA can do for you? Well, one, they can do like what mine does is clear out your email inbox, right? That's just great. So to log into your inbox and instead of seeing 100 messages, you see 20 and they're labeled. Oh, that's so good. Uh, number two, they can handle customer service issues. They can handle refund requests. I love, with the Recording Revolution, not seeing refund requests. I mean, my audience is so big. We make sales every day that there's there's refund requests that come in every week, right? It's just part of the business. I don't have to see those. It's just part of business, but I don't ever see it because part of you dies inside a little bit. Be honest when you see a refund request, but it's not personal, but it feels personal. And that's nice to have someone to handle that, but also someone who can be on top of it faster than you can. So you can just focus on high level content and products and sales copy and collaborating and networking while someone else handles customer service and refund requests. They can post content for you for your social channels. They can post content to your blogs. Like you could write a blog post and they can go and take snippets and post them as like quote graphics on your, your Instagram, right? That, that'd be amazing. Um, they can manage social media DMs or manage comments for you. So you don't have to respond to every comment or DM, but someone else could manage that for you and alert you to really interesting ones, um, ones that are like collaboration, someone high profile reaching out to you. They can sort of alert you to that or just sort of curate at the end of the week. Hey, here are the, here were your big DMs this week. Here are some of the big comments and they have screen grabs and point you in their direction if you want to go engage with them. They can curate all that information for you. And related to that, finally, um, you can have a VA create like weekly sales or analytics reports for you. So for example, um, I was teaching delegation in my my community and we had a master class and we've been going in deep and having a lot of questions and, and going back and forth on delegation over there uh, last month. Uh, and one of the questions I kept getting was practically like what, like how, how does your VA get access to like your email or like your, your, your back end? without like having access to sensitive information. And, and so there's a lot of answers and ways you can do it, but I'll just use one example, Kajabi, for example. Kajabi is how I run both of my businesses. All my emails are on Kajabi, my products, my memberships, like stuff, everything's on Kajabi. 
and Kajabi has sales reports and sales data, you can create unique Kajabi accounts or logins. So you could create one and there's different levels of access, admin level. There's even one called virtual assistant level, I believe, where it, it limits them to what they can do. All they can do is generate reports for you, right? And then and then issue refunds. So that's what I have set up for my VA where he goes in and he can generate reports for me if I wanted. I used to have a VA do that um, years ago. I don't anymore. I stopped even looking at sales reports. I just sort of look at whatever my accountant sends me and just look back in the mirror as opposed to looking every week like I used to. But um, I, I can have them generate weekly reports and you could have your VA do that as well. Send you, here's what happened this week. You know, we promoted this and then here's where the sales were. Um, or just overall analytics of your website. Like in Kajabi, you can see what pages are getting hit the most. You can see your opt-in analytics. Like you could have all that just emailed to you so you don't have to even be in the back end if you don't want to. Uh, and you can have separate levels of access for your VA to do this. And a practical question I got about email was, uh, are they responding as you or as themselves? And I have them responding as themselves. So my, my assistant has his own email account on the recordingrevolution.com. So it's will at the recordingrevolution.com. And so we have a shared inbox where we can see everything that comes in. He can get in there and see it just as well as I can. And he can respond as himself and leave things for me. And I can see the conversations if he had one back and forth with somebody. Maybe he's got a customer issue that's escalating and he leaves it for me and, and lets me know about it. I can see the, the thread of conversations. It all happens in one G Suite inbox. Um, because I have him set up his email account, have it all forward and all connected to my uh, Gmail account that's a, sort of the group email account, right? Um, so I would set up a support email account that you both have access to with separate emails um, so you can both respond. That way you can respond as yourself, as like the CEO if you want to, and then he or she can respond as themselves, as your assistant. Also makes you look a little more professional um, to have that assistant in there, right? So it's just a nice little thing. Practically, where do you find a VA? And this is where we're going to end it. There's a million places that you can do hiring for this type of thing, but just two that are really easy to use are Upwork.com and Fiverr.com. Upwork.com and Fiverr, which is F-I-V-E-R-R.com. What I love about both of these resources, I would say Upwork is a little more classy. Fiverr is a little more free-for-all, but I've gotten work on both. Um, it's, it's just a review-based system. So you type in what you're looking for. Graphic designer, uh, video editor, virtual assistant. These categories are all tagged. It'll pull up people who have a profile saying that they do these tasks. So if you type in virtual assistant in either one of those websites, you're gonna see a bunch of people who are looking to be hired as a virtual assistant. And since it's a relatively remote and uh, part-time position, they're generally going to be a virtual assistant for multiple people. And so if they're looking for a few more gigs or at least one more client, they'll have their services available. You can see a picture of them. You can see their description of what tasks they're good at doing, what skill sets they have, whether it's a piece of software or other tasks or skills they can do. And then there's going to be a review system, which is great. It's like the Amazon effect. You can see their star rating. You can see if people have hired them before, what people think, what their average review is, and you can see what they charge. You can see what they charge. So you can go find someone to reach out to that you see, like, I like their price point. I like the reviews. I like what they do. I want to start a conversation. Just reach out to them and start the conversation. Let them know what you're looking for. And you can go back and forth until you feel comfortable. It's very easy to find what you're looking for on Upwork or Fiverr. Uh, and the thing is, what I would say is two things to help you as we wrap up this conversation. Once you find somebody, because that's not going to be the hard thing. It's actually not going to be the hard thing is finding somebody. Once you find someone that you can afford, that you want to work with, and you go back and forth and you, you start a, a, a gig together, I would have like a 90-day trial period. And not to make them feel like a pressure, but say, look, let's work together initially for 90 days. And then let's touch base after those 90 days and see how we both feel. Do you enjoy working with me? Do I enjoy working with you? Is this a good fit? And if it is, then we will continue. You could even, if you wanted to, you could even sort of work out like a 90-day price where it's a little bit cheaper in those first 90 days. It just depends on, you know, whether you feel like that's fair to them and if they have incentive to want to impress you during those 90 days. Um, but either way, I would just say give yourself a 90-day window to give yourself an out and give them an out. Because if it's not a good fit, 
I mean, obviously you could just hire them in a heartbeat, but some people have a hard time hiring or firing, excuse me. You could fire them in a heartbeat. Some people have a hard time firing or it, it just like becomes personal. That way, if you just communicate it at the beginning, like, look, let's work together for the first 90 days, do some training, but that will give us plenty of time to see how this is going, see how we can improve. And after 90 days, let's have a meeting. Let's talk about it if we want to continue to work together moving forward because I'm looking for someone long-term, but I just want to make sure we're a good fit. So I would have a 90-day trial period and then there's just a good golden rule for golden rule for delegating that I stole from Tim Ferriss. When you're finally hiring your VA and thinking about uh, what you're going to give him or her to do for you, and it's this: each delegated task must be both time consuming and well defined. Time consuming and well defined. Why time consuming? Well, then what's the point of delegating it if it's not time consuming? I know there's a mental weight to anything you do, but if it's really not taking up a lot of your time, it's not going to feel like a win for you to delegate it. Delegate the things that just take a lot of time that you don't need to be doing. Those are the perfect type of tasks to delegate. But then more importantly, make sure that these tasks are well-defined, not vague, like clear through my inbox. That would be a good example of a ill-defined task. What does it mean to clear through your inbox? You need a doc, like a working doc that has instructions on what you want him or her to do. This helps him or her do exactly what you're paying them to do. So there's no questions, no question marks, even though you'll probably have some back and forth during an initial training period. But it also allows you to rehire down the road easier. When that person wants to move on, or you want to move on to somebody else, or you need someone with a better skill set, or they raise their prices and you don't want to pay that, and you want to hire someone else who's going to charge less, it's easier to get someone else in the slot if you already have a working updated doc that has the clearly well-defined tasks that the previous person was doing, right? It makes it a lot, lot easier. So the golden rule is each delegated task must be both time-consuming and well-defined. There it is. So my encouragement to you is to look at your tasks and find one time-consuming task that you could delegate today. Even at $10 an hour, for even five hours a week, that's 50 bucks a week, that's 200 bucks a month. Could you afford $200 a month to free up five hours of your week or 20 hours of your time in a given month, which is probably the equivalent of 40 hours of mental space? What would that task be? And then the follow-up action step to that would be just log into upwork.com or fiverr.com and just just type in virtual assistant and take a look. See what you find. If you don't have to contact anybody, you don't even have to be at a place where you feel like you can financially hire somebody, but just look around. Just taking that step to look around will make this feel less scary than it actually is. Nothing is permanent. You don't have to work with that person forever, but it is a lot easier to get started than you think. And again, the point of all of this is to free up your time and your mental space so that you can double down on the things that truly grow your business, which means growing your income. And before you go, related to growing your income, I wanted to give you something that can help you grow your income even before you delegate and hire. And that is my 90-day income boost cheat sheet. Just thinking through things you could do in the next 90 days to boost your income by 30% or more. This is going to help you get really, really focused. These are the things I want you to be doing while you delegate the stuff that you shouldn't be doing. I want you to be doing these things in my 90-day income boost cheat sheet to boost your income by 30% in the next three months. It's absolutely free. Just go to grahamcochran.com slash income boost to grab that cheat sheet. Or if you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to link to it below this video, grahamcochran.com slash income boost. Let me know if this episode was helpful to you. In a comment below if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, leave me a review and let me know if this episode was helpful to you. And as always, thanks for liking this comment, this content, excuse me, and subscribing to the channel and subscribing to the podcast. It helps me. It helps you stay abreast of what I'm doing and what I'm sharing and what I'm teaching. I hope you're staying healthy and safe wherever you are and focusing on growing your business even as the world seems to spin and spin and spin out of control. This is a perfect time for you and me to get focused and grow our businesses and scale. I'll talk to you soon for another episode. 
Take care.